Welcome to this site event on infrastructure. I'm co-hosting with US President Joe Biden. Thanks for your engagement, Joe. The G7 has set itself the ambition of making the world a better offer on infrastructure investment. Today, we are relaunching our joint work as a partnership for global infrastructure and investment. With our joint G7 infrastructure initiative, we are building on strong national and regional initiatives such as the EU Global Gateway Initiative and similar initiatives of other G7 members. Yet another example of our unity and close cooperation at SG7. The decision to work together on this offer to the world was taken last year in Carbis Bay. Since then, we have worked hard and made great progress. We have built a G7 structure for our cooperation and launched concrete partnerships on climate and health. On the structure of our cooperation, we are bringing together our development finance institutions, coordinate with multilateral banks and private sector, and setting up partnerships and country platforms. This is steep change for our cooperation that we have committed to. We are boosting local vaccine production in Africa. Germany has contributed 530 million euro as part of a larger Team Europe and G7 initiative. We are building strong partnerships to support the global transition to net zero. With our Just Energy Transition Partnerships, we support an accelerated clean and just transition of developing and emerging countries towards climate neutrality. The first GETP was launched with South Africa at COP26. I'm happy to announce today that the Germany, via its development bank, is ready to offer a promotional loan of 300 million euro for energy policy reforms as concrete support for this GETP. This is part of Germany's contribution to collective G7 support of 8.5 billion US dollar over the next three to five years. But we won't stop there. In a joint effort with G7 partners, we are currently working towards additional GETPs with Indonesia, India, Senegal and Vietnam. The public sector alone will not be able to close the huge investment gap we faced in many parts of the world. This is why we are promoting innovative instruments such as the Emerging Markets Climate Action Fund in order to mobilize private investment to for sustainable infrastructure. The G7 is committed to support the Emerging Markets Climate Action Fund and Germany is contributing additional 30 million euro adding to 25 million euro we have provided last year. The fund can mobilize up to 50 euro private capital for every single euro public money we provide. With our total contribution of 55 million euro, we can mobilize up to 2.75 billion euro. Just like, like our broader G7 agenda, our work on promoting infrastructure globally is also affected by the current geopolitical situation. We have therefore discussed how our investment globally in climate neutral and low carbon energy, including gas, can help us as a temporary response to Russia's use of energy as a weapon. Given the progress we have achieved, time is ripe to showcase our offer to the world under a common roof. I'm convinced the G7 makes a stronger, better and more convincing offer to partners globally. But beyond steps we have been taken this is a long-term undertaking. Germany will move this work forward beyond the Elmer Summit to make progress towards an equitable world, and I will hand over an even stronger joint initiative to FUMIO end of this year. And now I would like to hand over to the United States President. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, folks. <coughs> Our nations and our world stand at a genuine inflection point in history. Technology has made our world smaller, more immediate, and more connected. It's opened up incredible opportunities, but also accelerated challenges that impact on all of us. 
managing global energy needs, taking on the climate crisis, dealing with the spread of diseases. And the choices we make now, in my view, are going to set a direction of our world for several generations to come. These challenges are hard for all of us, even nations with resources of the G7. But developing countries often lack the essential infrastructure to help navigate global shocks like a pandemic. So they feel the impacts more acutely, and they have a harder time recovering. In our deeply connected world, that's not just a humanitarian concern. It's an economic and a security concern for all of us. That's why, one year ago, when this group of leaders met in Cornwall, we made a commitment. The democratic nations of the G7 would step up, step up and provide financing for quality, high-standard, sustainable infrastructure in developing and middle-income countries. What we're doing is fundamentally different because it's grounded on our shared values of all those representing the countries and organizations behind me. It's built using the global best practices, transparency, partnership, protections for labor and the environment. We're offering better options for countries and for people around the world to invest in critical infrastructure that improves the lives, their lives, all of our lives, and delivers real gains for all of our people, not just the G7, all of our people. Today, we officially launched the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. We collectively have dozens of projects already underway around the globe. And I'm proud to announce the United States will mobilize $200 billion in public and private capital over the next five years for that partnership. We're here today because we're making this commitment together as a G7 in coordination with one another to maximize the impact of our work. Collectively, we aim to mobilize nearly $600 billion from the G7 by 2027. These strategic investments are areas of critical to sustainable development and to our shared global stability, health and health security, digital connectivity, gender equality and equity, climate and energy security. Let me give you some examples of the kinds of projects that are underway in each of these areas. First, health. Two years ago, COVID-19 didn't need any reminders about how critical investments in health care systems were and health, sec and health security is, both to fight the pandemic and to prepare for the next one, because it will not be the last pandemic we, under we, we have to deal with. That's why the United States, together with the G7 partners and the World Bank, are investing in a new industrial-scale vaccine manufacturing facility in Senegal. When complete, we'll have the potential to produce hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine annually for COVID-19 and other diseases. It's an investment that will enhance global vaccine supplies as well as improve access and equity for developing countries. Second, in the digital area, our economy's future increasingly depends on people's ability to connect to secure information and communications technologies. We need to strengthen the use of trusted technologies so that our online information cannot be used by autocrats to consolidate their power or repress their people. That's why the Digital Invest program is mobilizing $335 million in private capital to supply secure network equipment in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And the U.S. government also supported the successful bid by an American company, Subcom, for a $600 million contract to build a global subsea telecommunications cable. This cable will stretch from Southeast Asia through the Middle East and the Horn of Africa to Europe. This will be essential to meeting the growing demand for reliable, security, high-tech connectivity in three key regions of the world. Third, gender. When women and girls have the ability and the opportunity 
participate more fully in their societies and economies, we see positive impacts not only in their communities, but around the board, across the board. We have to increase those opportunities, though, for women and girls to thrive, including practical steps to make child care more accessible and affordable as we continue the vital work to protect and advance women's fundamental rights. The United States is committing $50 million over five years to the World Bank Global Child Care Incentive Fund. This public-private partnership, supported by several G7 partners, will help countries build infrastructure that makes it easier for women to participate equally equally in the labor force. Fourth, and very important, climate and energy. We're seeing just how critical this is every day. The entire world is feeling the impact of Russia's brutal war in Ukraine and on our energy markets. We need worldwide effort to invest in transformative clean energy projects to ensure that critical infrastructure is resilient to changing climate. Critical materials that are necessary for our clean energy transition, including the production of batteries, need to be developed with high standards for labor and environment. Fast and reliable transportation infrastructure, including railroads and ports, is essential to moving inputs for refining and processing and expanding access to clean energy technologies. For example, the U.S. government just facilitated a new partnership between two American firms and the government of Angola to invest $2 billion in building the new solar projects in Angola. It's a partnership that will help Angola meet its climate goals and energy needs while creating new markets for American technologies and good jobs in Angola and, I suspect, throughout Africa. And in Romania, the American company New Scale Power will build the first of its kind small modular reactor plant. This will help bring online zero-emission nuclear energy to Europe faster, more cheaply, and more efficiently. The U.S. government is helping advance the development of this groundbreaking American technology, which will strengthen Europe's energy security and create thousands of jobs in Romania and the United States. These deals are just some of what's in store. And we're ready. We're ready to get to work together, all of us, to lead efforts to lead U.S. efforts, in my case, appointed — I appointed Amos Hochstein, my special presidential coordinator, to deal with the rest of our colleagues. I'll lead the U.S. whole-of-government approach to drive a coalition and a collaboration with the G7 and our partners around the world, including private sector and multilateral development banks. I want to be clear, this isn't aid or charity. It's an investment that will deliver returns for everyone, including the American people and the people of all our nations. It will boost all of our economies. It's a chance for us to share our positive vision for the future, to let communities around the world see themselves and see for themselves the concrete benefits of partnering with democracies. Because when democracies demonstrate what we can do, all that we have to offer, I have no doubt that we'll win the competition every time. Thank you. Now I invite President Van der Leyen to the podium. Thank you very much, Joe, Mr. President. Thank you, Olaf, Herr Bundeskanzler. We have just tried to overcome a global pandemic, and it shook the global economy. And then, as the global economy was just recovering, Russia's vicious attack on Ukraine happened driving prices up everywhere from food to energy and casting deep uncertainty, especially in the most fragile countries. These are very severe challenges. We will tackle them head on. And this is why G7 partners are gathered here. But this must not, and it will not, divert us away from our <coughs> affirmative agenda. To show the world that democracies, when they work together, provide the single best path to deliver results for our people and people all over the world on climate, on health security, and on digital innovation. And indeed, last November at COP26, thank you again, Boris, for the initiative, we announced our plans to step up globally investments in climate-positive infrastructure. 
This was our response to the commitment we made at Carbis Bay, and I will never forget the start of this initiative at Glasgow together with you, Joe, and you, Boris. It was the beginning of a success story. Today, the world needs these investments more than ever. And that is what the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment is all about. So now, what should we do? We should work side by side. And this is the one and only way to maximize the potential of our investments and to demonstrate the power of development finance when it reflects democratic values. That is transparency, inclusivity, and sustainability. When it embraces high standards for the environment and for the workers. And when it mobilizes the private sector. That's what success looks like. On our side, Europe's response to the world's investment gap is Global Gateway. It's going to be under the roof of the Global Partnership for Infrastructure and Investment. It's the Team Europe approach. And to the 200 billion Euro, uh, dollars, dollars that have just been announced by the President of the United States, Team Europe is mobilizing 300 billion euros till 2027, over the next seven years, from both public and private sources. 300 billion euros for sustainable quality infrastructure and also for health infrastructure. Investments that are transparent and that improve everyday lives and bring real benefit for the communities on the ground. Global Gateway is fully at work and we're listening closely to the recipient countries so that we can better understand their needs and deliver the biggest impact. We already have many great examples to share. Some of them have already been named. The mRNA vaccine manufacturing plants, for example. We just extended this successful program to Latin America, too. But, for example, also the Great Green Wall, a project for food security and land restoration on the continent. Or take the submarine fiber optic cable, ELLA, linking Europe to Latin America. The upcoming clean hydrogen project with Egypt, Namibia, and Chile. And, for example, constructing a port to connect Christmas Island in the South Pacific to the rest of the world. These are projects in the right direction to travel. They are designed and implemented in full consultation and partnership with the countries and population concerned, because that's our way to do business. So my point is, we need to see more of these projects get off the ground in every corner of the earth. The earth. And for this, we really need as democracies to pull our common weight. The European Union and Japan, for example, are already doing that, dear Fumio, as part of our connectivity partnership. Or South Africa has been named, where all G7 are supporting the just energy transition. And we will continue our work and do more projects together. We will optimize our collective power, because it is up to us to give a positive, powerful investment impulse to the world, to show our partners in the developing world that they have a choice and that we intend to step up in solidarity to meet their development needs. In doing so, we'll show once again that democracies are prepared and meet the moment. Therefore, my dear friends, let's continue the good work. Thank you. So now I may ask the Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, to take the floor. First of all, I welcome the initiative by Joe and Olaf. Infrastructure investment is indispensable for the promotion of productivity and prosperity across the world. Infrastructure such as ports and harbors, railways or airports underpin the lives of the people and economic activities and will be the foundation of the country's development. However, that does not mean 
that the development of a large amount of infrastructure would suffice, even if the initial cost is inexpensive. It may lack economic efficiency in view of the life cycle as a whole, or if infeasible debt repayment plans cause the recipient countries to default, it would, after all, inhibit the growth of that country. Therefore, in accordance with the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment, which incorporate transparency, openness, economic efficiency, and sustainability, and others, it is important for the G7 members to unite and promote quality infrastructure investment. From such perspective, our country will announce that in the next five years, we will aim to realize more than $65 billion of infrastructure assistance and mobilization of private sector capital. In addition to the challenges such as COVID-19 or climate change at the moment, due to the aggression of Ukraine, the global economy is facing price spikes of energy and food or the disruption of supply chains. In order to deal with these situations, quality infrastructure investment again is indispensable. But the development of quality infrastructure is also crucial for the realization of a free and open Indo-Pacific. For the Indo-Pacific region, we will work on railways and airports that contribute to regional connectivity or the development of ports and harbors for maritime security and the reinforcement of economic security, including cybersecurity. Going forward, Japan will execute international cooperation by appropriate, efficient, and strategic use of ODA and expand ODA and will strengthen diplomatic efforts and will continue to deepen our collaboration with respective countries, including the G7. Thank you. Now I will ask uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, to take the floor. Merci, Olaf. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be here with President Biden, Chancellor Schultz, and everyone participating in this event today. A year ago, at the G7 summit in the UK, we made the commitment to change our approach to investment for infrastructure with the goal of strengthening our partnership with others around the world. Everybody here agrees that we need to work together in order to overcome the gaps that exist in infrastructure in developing countries. And it's essential that we do this in order to promote sustainable development, create jobs, and promote trade whilst protecting the environment. I was just at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda with me, uh, this week with Prime Minister Boris Johnson, where we had the opportunity to talk about these challenges with many African leaders. And earlier this month in Los Angeles, I met with my co-chair of the UN Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goals Advocates Group, Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados. We focused on mobilizing all possible resources, government, the private sector, multilateral development banks, and philanthropic foundations. Since the G7 last year, we've made significant progress together, including commitments to support countries in managing their own energy transitions away from coal and other fossil fuels. Canada doubled its international climate finance commitment to $5.3 billion over five years, in large part to support these efforts, which include a $1 billion investment in the Accelerating Coal Transition Program. Of course, if we want to close the infrastructure gap, we have to find ways to incentivize greater private sector investment because no amount of public money can single-handedly fix this issue. That's why, at home, organizations such as our Development Finance Institute, FinDev Canada, is helping build a blended finance platform in partnership with key institutional investors. We're doing this to lower the risks for private sector partners and put their capital to work to help solve today's big problems. Canada's private sector is already a significant investor, investor in global infrastructure, and we're going to help them do even more of it.
We know that a great deal of work still remains to be done by all of us. We must remain focused, determined, and united. And today, we reaffirm once again our commitment vis a vis our partners to take forward this infrastructure development, pro inter development program. Supporting these efforts through a common strategic approach, I look forward to continuing to work with you all during this summit and mostly over the years to come. Merci beaucoup. Now I ask the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, to speak to us. Thank you, dear Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Thank you, dear President of the United States, for organizing this event. The EU fully supports the G7 partnership on global infrastructure and investment. And the reason is simple. We have always been a leader in cooperating with developing countries. 46% of global development aid comes from the European Union. And everywhere, almost 70 billion euros go to fund more peace, more prosperity, and more development. The G7 is committed to values, standards, transparency, principles, and so is the EU. We focus on smart, clean, and secure investments in sustainable infrastructure, in digital, climate, energy, or transport. And we also invest in the power and potential of people in their education and health and in cutting-edge research. The EU is a project of peace and prosperity anchored in the rule of law and multilateralism. We widely are partners around high standards of human, social, and workers' rights, and our G7 partnership wants to drive forward infrastructure that's sustainable, inclusive, resilient, and high quality in emerging markets and in developing countries. For instance, with investments in vaccines and medicine production, notably in African countries. Multilateral development banks will play a catalyst role in mobilizing private capital along with our public support. The European Union is moving forward with our Global Gateway Initiative. At our EU-Africa Summit last February, we announced an Africa-Europe investment package of 150 billion euros. We are investing in many concrete projects in Africa and with Africa. The submarine Eurafrica Gateway Cable and the local pharmaceutical cooperation are two good examples. In the Indo-Pacific, we are very engaged in the field of sustainable connectivity in transport, energy, and technology. In conclusion, we need values and standards, and that's why we are fully on board. I believe, I'm convinced, that the G7 and the EU are taking the right direction for a more stable and forward-looking partnership. I thank you. The last that will speak here to us is uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi. Thank you, Olaf. Just two words after everything has been said. This group of countries is being the largest financier in assistance to investment projects in developing countries. We have to do more, and we also want to be this effort widely acknowledged in partnerships with the developing countries. Multilateral development banks, and especially the World Bank, will be mobilized even further together with the private sector. Again, a wide effort of partnership with developing countries has to be undertaken. The areas You've, you've heard the many areas in which these investment projects are going to be undertaken, but on two areas I want to put more stress. One is energy, and the other one is health care. Energy. It's quite clear that in the present situation, we'll have short-term needs that will require large investments in gas infrastructure in developing countries and elsewhere. But we have to make sure that they can be retroverted to carry hydrogen. So that's a way to reconcile short-term needs 
with long-term climate needs. And also, many developing countries and one continent, Africa, is uh, exceptionally suited for investments in renewables. And that's where I would expect all our countries to fund and design, identify and design many, many investment projects in this area. On vaccines, again, this group of countries being the Euro European Union and the United States has been by, by far the largest donor. This group of countries, including Canada and Japan, by far the largest donors of vaccines. And we'll continue many initiatives in this field. But now it's clear that more is needed, namely to enable African countries and other countries to produce the vaccines in their own, on their own land, so that the vaccine could be readily available to their people. Thank you. Thank you to you all.